don't know how to hide the uh, top screen here, but not try to. There's on the more you can go to hide. Video panel, is that it? Oh, hide the thing you can close that one. The one below, yeah. Oh, that's great, okay. All right, much easier. Okay, um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the stuff that uh, I've done in the past, I'll summarize that, some of the things that are going on and some preliminary data that uh, we've collected in the last couple of months. Uh, my interest lies in behavior. And as a, um, uh, I guess, as an aspiring chemist, a biochemist, I do believe in the um, uh, materialist view that our behaviors are regulated by molecules, by chemistry in the brain, which means that they should be understandable with physical principles. Of course, um, behavior is a very, very complex uh, set of systems. So understanding it has been very elusive, but trying to take more of a molecular approach, I'm hoping to convince you that we may actually start uncovering some of these mechanisms. Um, first, we can define behavior as a, a mechanism for gene propagation. Now, we usually think about phenotypes in terms of, say, the color. Um, we think of um, uh, usually phenotypes as, say, the color of a bird or the uh, fins on a fish that actually help um, uh, the animal propagate its genes, but behavior is also one of these phenotypes. And this is often overlooked because I think we still have a very egocentric view of who we are on, on this planet um, and don't really quite recognize how we're similar. Yeah. 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 It's okay, it, this, this will help me take small breaks. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's totally fine. So um, behavior is um, can be oversimplified into this uh, slide where you have some sort of external input, something happens, and there's an actionable output. So this external input could be something as simple as uh, exposure to light, which is a bit of foreshadowing for what I'm going to be talking about, or it could be as complex as watching a movie, remembering an incident from your past, and remembering that you want to reconnect with an old friend. So, um, but nonetheless, I believe that these are all similar mechanisms. And by studying the simpler ones, we can gain a lot of insight into the more complex mechanisms that exist out there. Excuse me. So uh, what happens when things go wrong with, uh, with behavior? So you can have uh, behavioral disorders that include neuropsychiatric disorders. And I pulled this out from a paper uh, now about three years old, three years ago, to look to see what genes have been associated with something like schizophrenia. And many, uh, many of you will not be familiar with what these genes are, and I have no idea either. But I did look them up. And the first gene on this list in this tabulated form is a transcription factor, which kind of makes sense that you would, if you looked at a schizophrenic patient and you look to see what genes were affected, a transcription factor does fall out of that. And this kind of fits in with the genetic regulation uh, ideology, idea of behavior control. Um, there's also a tRNA hydroxylase that's implicated that is basically just loading an amino acid onto the tRNA and that is involved in translation. So again, it's a part of the same pathway. It's a part of gene expression. So that kind of buttresses the point that this is a genetic phenomenon. But if you start going down the list, you'll notice that there's a mitochondrial transport protein that's involved as well. So metabolism seems to be involved. Vesicle trafficking now all of a sudden seems to be involved. Um, phosphorylation cascades are involved, another transcription factor, a heat shock factor, a, a kinase, a cell-cell interaction protein similar to cadherins, and a trypsin inhibitor of all things. So this basically tells us nothing. So if, if every gene is involved in schizophrenia, then nothing is involved in schizophrenia. Now, you could say some of this might be circumstantial. Maybe the tra transcription factor is affecting all these other things, and that is a possibility. But the millions of dollars that have been spent on GWAS experiments are to see if there's any proper correlation in the interest of causation. And 
nobody's been able to identify a genetic pathway that speaks to a specific behavioral disorder that we observe. So the question remains, exactly how do these behavioral disorders arise? Now, I say this a little bit in um, as a tangent, but I am going to bring you back to this later on in the talk. So I just want to seed this uh, problem in your mind right now. So back to behavior, it's... That's right. Okay, so back to behavior, we're interested in understanding how these gears turn. And even though I might be in the faculty of medicine, uh, between you and me and uh, the internet, um, I'm not too interested in helping people with behavioral disorders per se. Um, I'm not interested in understanding a disease. You can understand a disease only if you understand nature itself. I'm more interested in understanding how nature works because if you do, then you'll actually understand how diseases work. So what I've uh, decided to do was try to study behavior, not from um, a medical point of view, but just from a very simplistic point of view. And in order to be able to do that, you have to consider what sort of behavioral responses exist. Now, there is something called evolutionary learning. Some of you in the audience or online might be repulsed by these animals, but you don't necessarily have an experience with them. You don't have to have had a bad experience with a snake to look the other way or to distance yourself from one. It's because this is evolutionarily learned. If your ancestors went around petting a bunch of snakes, they were less likely to survive. So they, that desire just got selected against. But then there's, take that away if uh, that was a repulsive, but then there's experiential learning, which complicates behavior. If you see a skull and crossbones on a bottle, you know not to drink it, but you weren't born with this information. Uh, if you're like me, you learned it through cartoons. So uh, you, you recognize that symbol and you decide that you want to stay away from it. So this makes understanding behavior a lot more complex because you cannot, even if you have genetically identical twins, their experiences complicates their behavior and complicates understanding how they behave. So in my research, I focused on the evolutionarily learned behaviors. And that's brings us to circadian rhythms. So circadian rhythms are basically, um, I guess my fancy talk for this is, it's an organism's adaptation to planetary rhythms. So what that means is that as the planet turns, from our point of view, we see the sunrise and sunset. So what we need to do is adapt our behavior so that we can function as efficiently as possible on earth. There is no sense for example, you, for you to go out hunting if you're, you know, a Neanderthal living in a cave or something like that, because you're not going to really see your prey. So it's behavior, it's better to uh, consolidate your behavior into the daytime when you can see what you're hunting. Of course, there are nocturnal animals that do the opposite, and there are plenty of examples. Now, the other thing to consider is your physiology needs to kind of fit in with this. And we do think of behavior and physiology as separate, but this is actually a problem because if you take hunger as an example, you don't necessarily get hungry when you're sleeping, or even if you do, you don't notice it. Uh, and, that, and, and that's for a good reason. But if you're not going to be hungry when you're sleeping, you don't want your uh, metabolic, metabolic systems to be functioning the way they should be during the day. So animals, plants, some fungi, some uh, many unicellular uh, cells, actually uh, adapt to day-night cycles on Earth. And so do we. I did infer that uh, earlier that we try to keep ourselves separate, but it actually, uh, circadian behavior manifests in very interesting ways. This is a map of New York City where I lived for a few years. And if you look at this population density map, on the left-hand side, you'll see the density of uh, lower Manhattan on the, uh, during the day. And on the right, you'll see the uh, population density of lower Manhattan at night. So if you were an alien coming in from space on another planet with different planetary rhythms, you would notice a migration of people to different parts of the city all over the world that coincides with when the city moves into the sun and then moves away from the sun. And you might actually infer uh, different causality for this, whereas what it really is, is we can just see during the day and we, we become diurnal and that's when the boss wants us to get to work. 
So I didn't um, suggest that physiology is connected to this as well. So, um, so the students especially will um, uh, appreciate that if you go to the cafeteria at about one o'clock, you're not going to be able to, to get your lunch quickly and get back to the lab or get back to class because there's going to be a long line because we're synchronized as, as a society. But if you go there at two o'clock or three o'clock, it's fairly easy, although you are going to be stuck with leftovers. So that behavior and our physiology have to be coincident. And that is actually uh, described here in a very, um, uh, I guess, simplistic way. So because we're diurnal animals, we actually have our highest alertness in the morning. That's because we have a burst of testosterone and a burst of adrenaline while we're waking up to really get us out of bed. Works better for some people than others. Yeah. <laughs> As you go through the day, uh, you have high blood pressure towards the evening. Your melatonin secretion starts towards um, towards nighttime, and then you fall into your deepest sleep at approximately three to four in the morning. Now there are mutations and there is genetic variation that drift that, and that is a whole area of study in a, in and of itself. But the cycle lap, um, loops back. Your melatonin secretion stops your adrenaline glands start kicking in and you wake up and on and on it goes. If you take any single person here in this room and put them into an isolated room, you take all the clocks away, you take the sun away and you just kind of leave them to themselves, everybody here will continue to have a 24 hour rhythm. You'll still want to get hungry at about the same time. You'll still get sleepy at about the same time. And that's because you have an endogenous clock that keeps ticking away. The best analogy I can think of is when you take your phone and put it in airplane mode, your phone is connected to the internet somehow, and it does reset every time the clocks change or every time you move to a different time zone. But if you keep it in airplane mode when you're on the plane, it continues to tell the time to you, but that's because it has an internal clock. And that's exactly how we are. We have our internal clock that synchronizes with people around us, or it synchronizes with the time of day. Some people actually have mutations where they cannot get out of airplane mode. The best way we can actually understand circadian rhythms is the consolidation of sleep into the nighttime. And then we use that as a proxy for understanding circadian behavior. But that is not the same thing as sleep behavior itself. I just kind of want to underscore that. But for our purposes, we can say, yeah, they're, they're, they're the same thing. But since we can't work on humans, um, even if it was ethical, the gestation times are just a nightmare. Mm -hmm. So we focus on model organisms and this and the choice of uh, model organism for myself is the fruit fly, which uh, you probably know about through Nicanor. Um, so what we do is we take these flies and if we want to understand their behavior, we put them in these things called Drosophila activity monitors. And what we have here, I hope you can see this arrow, good. Um, what we have here are glass tubes that are sealed at one end with a rubber plug. Um, and on the other hand, uh, on the other end rather, uh, we have a cotton plug that prevents the fly from getting out. So this fly now is restricted to one dimensional movement. It can't fly around, it can't walk around the surface, it just paces back and forth. What, what we have in the uh, activity monitor here are infrared beams that uh, bisect this, well, I guess in this uh, tetrasect, I guess it would be, um, this, uh, these glass tubes. And as the animal walks back and forth, uh, it breaks these infrared beams. And this monitor that is inside an environmentally regulated incubator is connected to a computer and it just counts those beam breaks. And those beam breaks can be assembled into a graph. The, in, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the incubator that we use for these are so that we can regulate temperature and light. And those are the main input points for the uh, circadian clock, the endogenous circadian clock. So what we have is a light dark cycle for three days that we keep them in. And then at one point we turn off the lights and the sun never rises again for these animals. And we monitor their behavior under those conditions. So we take the data, assemble it into what we call an actogram. On the y-axis of this actogram, you'll see the number of beam breaks, which is our uh, proxy for locomotion. And across the x-axis, we have time. 
The first half of this graph is one day. The second half is the second day. So we plot these into a what we call a double plot. So it goes day one, day two, day two, day three, day three, day four, and so forth. You will notice that right before the sun rises, so to speak, there is an increase in uh, behavior. This is very similar to you setting your alarm clock for say, I don't know, 6.30 a.m. or 7 a.m. for two weeks and then not setting your clock anymore and waking up anyway. That's because you've entrained yourself. And these animals are also entrained so they anticipate when the lights will come on. And this is a very important feature of circadian behavior. In the middle of the day, they like taking a bit of a siesta, males more so than females actually, but um, towards the evening, um, their adrenaline or whatever the equivalent is in flies kicks in again, and there's increased behavior uh, right before sunset. And this evolutionarily makes sense as well. If you're out in the forest and if the sun is uh, starting to set, you probably want to find shelter as soon as possible so you don't fall prey. You will notice, yeah, there was an arrow there too. You will notice that when we turn the lights off, uh, these peaks of activity remain at exactly the, well, almost exactly at the same time. It's actually the endogenous clock is not exactly 24 hours, it's about 23.6 hours. And the other thing you will notice is that the morning activity peak starts to disappear, but the evening activity peak persists. This is the molecular clock that regulates all of this. It regulates the behavior, it regulates the physiology and so forth. And this is a simple genetic circuit. I am not going to uh, get bogged down in details with you, but what I am going to do is emphasize the, emphasize the key loop here. So what we have in the molecular clock is a clock cycle transcriptional activator complex. And this triggers the expression of approximately 700 genes in the fly. It's thousands in humans. That right there uh, underscores how much uh, physiology and how much genetic material this single clock regulates, how important it is for us to be synchronized with our environment. Of the 700 genes or so in the fly that this uh, activator complex activates, we have period and timeless, which are important for historical reasons. Period and timeless are also transcription factors that are translated in the cytoplasm, and they come together to form the transcriptional inhibitor complex. That is imported back into the nucleus where it binds the clock and cycle, inactivating it. And after a time, period and timeless are degraded, which releases clock and cycle, and, that, and this way the loop kind of uh, loops back on itself. And this is what we call a negative feedback loop. And if there are physics aficionados among you, you will know that if you uh, engineer delays in any negative feedback loop, the system will start to oscillate. And indeed, there is a delay between transcription and translation. There's a delay between uh, complex formation and then nuclear entry. And there's a delay in degrading the transcriptional inhibitor complex as well. And all of these delays are perfectly tuned to maintain us at about 24 hours. Super interesting thing about this, at least from my perspective, these are all enzymatically regulated, but if you change the temperature, especially in flies that cannot maintain their own temperature, the clock never changes 24 hours. And this is a huge question in the field. Nobody really knows how temperature compensation works. One theory is some things speed up and other things slow down. And one theory is that there are a whole bunch of heat shock factors that make sure everything stays short or, and, or controlled. Now, this negative feedback loop, which I'll call the circadian clock or the molecular clock going forward, exists in different parts of the brain. And these are the so-called master clocks. Now, there are clocks in every tissue in your body, in every tissue in animals' bodies, but they all need to communicate with each other. And there is some sort of established or assumed hierarchy. The if we look at the um, a little diagram that I made of half of the brain of a uh, of a fly, this down here is the whole brain of the fly. You'll see the optic lobes on either side, the dorsal side and the ventral side. And uh, in this diagram, you'll notice that there I've kind of highlighted about seven neuronal clusters. 
And you will note that I have nothing about how they're synaptically connected with each other because that is an area of research right now. But what we do know is that we have these clusters and they're anatomically distinct from each other. They're spread out across the brain. And they do, the, um, the current uh, idea, the current theory right now is that these neurons must be rigidly um, connected with each other, kind of like a phalanx to uh, maintain uh, oscillations. And the blue neurons here, the names are not that important, the blue neurons there are important for light input from the eye, whereas the brown neurons at the very top are important for sensing heat and interpreting that. So these neurons communicate with each other based on their own abilities, and they maintain synchrony with each other to regulate the synchrony of the animal. Okay. Oh, yes. And another important thing that I should mention is that um, while... Uh, the synapses are not uh, present in this diagram because we don't know what they are. They do exist. We do know that they exist. But by virtue of the fact that these are insects, one of the main ways that the neurons communicate with each other is also neuropeptide signaling. So there is a neuropeptide that I want to emphasize called pigment dispersing factor, PDF. PDF is released by these blue and pink neurons, and they uh, regulate the um, uh, the response from all of the other neurons and the and the rest of the body, and because of this, these blue and pink neurons are considered the master clock neurons, the master neurons. So, uh, in of the two, the pink ones more so. They've done some experiments where they've eliminated eliminated those neurons. The flies no longer have circadian behavior. What they've done is they've eliminated the clocks in the uh, in different parts of the brain. And so all of the circumstantial evidence suggests that these pink neurons are indeed uh, the master clock neurons that communicate uh, everywhere else. And by inference, PDF is the main neuropeptide that, uh, I guess, imposes uh, pink neuron rule on everybody else. Okay, so that is being challenged. Now, we, uh, we are different than flies, obviously, even though we're 65% uh, similar. Um, flies allow light to go inside them. We don't, we're too big for that. And we communicate into our brain through our eye. Now that is the visual response, but we also have other cells in our eyes that are, um, uh, I guess, employed for circadian purposes only. So you can be visually blind, but you can be circadianly responsive, if you will. So we've started developing an interest in how the eye communicates with the rest of the brain. And there are two um, possible scenarios for how this happens. The eyes, even though it says visual system there, just think of it as eye, uh, communicates with the with those LNVs, those those pink neurons that are supposed to be the master neurons, and 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 forces those quote unquote master neurons to communicate with everyone else, or the eye actually bypasses those pink neurons and communicates directly with everyone else, and so as you can imagine, the uh, the right hand model is more uh, sacrilegious these days. And the left-hand model is the more established model. So that starts to bring, uh, that sets up the, uh, I guess, uh, the room for what I've been doing, what I've uh, uh, been focusing on. And as you, uh, from Nikonor's uh, nice introduction of me, you'll know that I'm more chemically inclined. Um, so I've been looking more at the biochemical mechanisms of how things might be happening. I'm not too interested in where the arrows go. I'm more interested in where the proteins go. So uh, what, what I'm gonna do is try to summarize my years of New York in just one slide here, <laughs> okay? So what we have is if period is in the cytoplasm, uh, period can get phosphorylated by a protein called double time. Double time is casein kinase one in every other animal, but fly geneticists like to use weird names. So double time. Um, double time phosphorylates period, which leads to, to its ubiquitation, which leads to its degradation. Now, if timeless is expressed as well, now you'll remember period and timeless as the transcription inhibitor complex proteins. Period and timeless come together to form that complex. 
and double time can no longer phosphorylate period to induce its degradation. You will notice that there are other proteins in here too. There's a protein called Shaggy, and the rest of the world knows this as GSK3. There's casein kinase 2, and there's a protein called cryptochrome, which is a deep brain blue light sensor. So this uh, transcription uh, inhibitor complex, once formed in the cytoplasm, is phosphorylated by GSK3. And this phosphorylation event is a gated event. So once Tim accepts this phosphorylation, it opens it up to being phosphorylated by casein kinase 2. And this, these phosphorylation events gate nuclear entry and make sure that it's timed properly. If you mess around with any of these phosphorylation events, you, you can actually speed up or slow down nuclear entry. So it's, it's the, um, think of it as a fine tuning mechanism. Once in the nucleus, double time phosphorylates period, not to trigger its degradation, but to activate its inhibition function. So it inhibits clock and cycle by removing it from the DNA and shutting off transcription at that point. After another delay through mechanisms that are not clear, but I suspect involve casein kinase too, timeless is degraded, period, it can now be phosphorylated by double time, just like it would have been outside in the cytoplasm, and it will be degraded. And so this degradation now uh, permits full activity of the transcriptional activator complex, and now period and timeless can be transcribed again, and the loop continues. What I want to focus on uh, is casein kinase 2 a little bit, because casein kinase 2 is implicated in TIM stability or timeless stability, and casein kinase 2 is also involved in nuclear entry. Here's when things actually start to get interesting. Casein kinase 2 is expressed only in those pink and blue neurons, those master clock neurons. Casein kinase 2 is not expressed in any of the other neurons. So how can you have a mechanism that is uh, central to the regulation of something as important as nuclear entry, only in two of the seven neuronal clusters. This suggests that either there are other kinases in these neurons that kind of pick up the slack for CK2, or there are different regulatory mechanisms to begin with. So, <laughs> I, I guess I just covered the first one. So the, but this also, um, to focus on the second point here, this also suggests then that if I go in and I mutate the sites that casein kinase 2 is supposed to phosphorylate, so it does not, uh, uh, it cannot phosphorylate it, then there should be no effect in the, in the neurons that don't express casein kinase 2. So this is a testable hypothesis, and I, I have. Um, foreshadowing again. And so the, the question then becomes, though, how do these clocks get synchronized? Now, there, there's something I think that uh, I, uh, is super interesting in that if you do have a mutation that blocks the mechanism in some neurons and not others, if you have a mutation that is basically genomic across the entire, across all cells, what you've done with a single mutation is changed one subset of uh, neurons and not another subset of neurons. So in, in essence, you've actually you're forcing these neurons to oscillate out of synchrony with each other. Okay. Let's go to the mutation. So if we mutate um, uh, Tim, timeless, so that it cannot be phosphorylated by GSK3. That's the data I'm showing, but this is also true of uh, casein kinase 2. Um, what you end up with is delaying nuclear entry, and, well, you expect to delay nuclear entry, and you should expect a long behavioral rhythm. So instead of 24 hours, it should be something longer than that. And if we do look at this double plot, you'll notice that in a wild-type fly, it's approximately the expected 23 and a half hours of uh, behavioral oscillation. And in the mutant fly, we have an approximately 31 hour um, behavioral oscillation. So these flies don't have a 24 hour day anymore. They have a 31 hour day because of that delay in nuclear entry. So we have identified a mechanism here. 
if we take a look at the brain, if we take a look at those neurons that are supposed to be those master clock neurons again, we find that wild type timeless shown in red here is cytoplasmic at what we call ZT16. And that is just, if you would just follow the black and the white boxes here, the black is nighttime and the white is daytime. So I guess in this case, it would be just eight hours before sunrise. So four hours into the night, all timeless is in the cytoplasm where you would expect it to be. As time moves on, with four hours before sunrise, you have timeless that has entered the nucleus. And now the timeless period repressor complex can block transcriptional activity. If you go keep going further in time, you'll notice that timeless starts to disappear right as the sun rises, which releases clock and sight. So that, that feedback loop that I showed you, it, this is basically just putting that into a timeline. So four hours before sunrise, the repressor complex goes into the nucleus. If we take this mutant, you will notice that it does indeed start out uh, in the cytoplasm of these um, neurons, and it stays in the cytoplasm of these neurons until just about sunrise. So it barely gets in there when it's triggered to start degradation. And if we quantify this, you will note that the delay in nuclear entry is approximately six to seven hours, which correlates fantastically with the behavioral change. And to be honest, when I did do this work, um, I thought, great, I have a great story, I can publish it. Then I asked myself a what if question, and I'm really grateful that I did. I said, what, what happens if I look at the other neurons? Now, if I look at the other neurons, this delay is different in all of them. This, I think, is the most interesting here. These are the blue neurons that, uh, you know, the ones that were taking input from the, light, from the eye. The mutants and the wild type look wild type. The mut mutation is completely silent. There is no effect in nuclear entry in these neurons. There's a seven hour delay in these other neurons. If we go down here, there's a four hour delay in the green neurons. The brown neurons are delayed by even more than seven hours. I don't know, take, take your guess, call it eight, nine. And in some neurons, these, um, oh geez, how to, how to describe these, the magenta, I guess, or the pinker pink neurons, there are no, uh, there is no nuclear entry at all. So we have an entire spectrum of phenotypes, molecular phenotypes, if you will, from a single mutation. So the hypothesis that my lab is working on, that I'm working on, is that rhythmic behavior is the convergence of different clocks across the circadian neuronal network. The context of the gene, the context of a behavior gene like a circadian gene is incredibly important. And by that, what I mean is the biochemical context. A transcription factor will serve as a transcription factor, but it will rely on the regulatory proteins around it. Now, not to draw, a, a, I guess, a tortured analogy, but you can have a great car, but if you can't find the service stations for it, it's not going to run well. So you kind of need the different service stations to get that car going. So behavioral genetics seems to be have focused on just the cars this entire time. And um, we've started trying to move it more into understanding how those cars run in a context. So the things that we're working on thinking about is uh, in a very oversimplified way, if we have a three neuron circuit, where the blue neuron uh, uh, interacts with the brown neuron, which uh, interacts with the green neuron, does the clock in the blue neuron, the information from the clock in the blue neuron, simply get transmitted to the green neuron through electrical activity? Or does the clock information from the blue get embedded in the brown to be communicated to the green neuron? So it, this is, uh, I guess, a bit of a fancy way of saying, is it true that the circadian neural network is actually rigid lockstep uh, a phalanx formation? So this is when I want to wrap it back to that schizophrenia table that I showed you. So what if then 
Well, all these people who are doing these experiments on uh, patients that who have schizophrenia or maybe bipolar or other disorders, they see these different genes and they don't, they maybe, maybe they shouldn't even be looking for a specific genetic circuit. Maybe the whole point is that the mutation or the change in expression of a gene has different effects in different parts of the brain. And maybe it's not the function of the gene that's the problem. It's the fact that you've actually dis, uh, disconnected the different regions. You've caused a miscommunication through an asynchrony. And maybe that is the problem when it comes to behavioral disorders. And so that is, the, uh, that is one of the central hypotheses in the lab that we aim to uh, test, proving more difficult than I anticipated. So it'll hopefully carry me to the end of my career. So to be able to now, to be able to understand these different clocks, um, we actually need to develop new systems. Because up until now, I told you in my introduction that uh, circadian behavior is uh, tested by looking at sleep to see where, this, where sleep is consolidated. I showed it to you as recently as two slides ago. Hey, look, it's a 31 hour rhythm and that's just based on locomotion activity. That's the convergence of all clocks. So we need to be able to look at individual clocks if we're gonna actually start answering some of these questions. Unfortunately for me, or maybe fortunately for me, there were no tools to be able to do this when I started asking these questions. So we had to invent them. So the first thing that we invented was something called we called locally activatable bioluminescence or label because we would be labeling the neurons. We fused a period promoter. Now, to remind you, the period promoter is activated by that clock cycle uh, activator complex. So it's a circadian responsive promoter. The period promoter is fused to M-cherry, which is fused to luciferase. M-cherry is a red fluorescence protein, and luciferase is the luminescence protein you'll find in fireflies. So you will get a luciferase signal without any external energy input, but to see the red, you need to zap it with green lasers. And what we did was very cleverly, if I may say, uh, flanked M-Cherry with FRT recombination sites. One of the advantages of Drosophila is that it's a very powerful genetic system. And we have a GAL4 UAS system that allows us to express any gene that we want in any tissue that we want. So what we decided to do was use this GAL4 UAS system to express the recombinase that these FRT uh, sequences rely on called FLIPase. And what we do is induce a chromosomal rearrangement to remove that M cherry between period and luciferase. And at that point, what we have is we leave luciferase under the regulation of a circadian promoter in any neuron that we want. Then we can monitor the oscillation of those uh, luciferase, that luciferase signal, the luminescence signal, and actually monitor how each individual clock changes. And just kind of send that, and this would be the setup of the luminometer. Actually, just um, I don't know how I'm doing for time, but um, so what we did was work with a company to develop the uh, equipment, and we built the flies ourselves. So I'll take you through what we uh, found. We actually see that when we activate label in all circadian tissue, we actually get a very lovely oscillation of luminescence with a 24-hour period. And if we compare that to the behavioral oscillations, you'll notice that the morning anticipation peak does disappear as quickly as uh, I showed you before, but the evening oscillation peak, actually as it goes down, as we fit an S curve into those peaks, the point of inflection of the, of the loss of amplitude correlates really nicely with the loss of amplitude with the luminescence signal as well. So we have a really, really pretty uh, correlation there. And, what we can do also is do a more, more lit wavelet fitting where we have a wavelet that kind of slides across the luminescence signal here, trying to fit the ideal uh, graph into this. And we find that it is at approximately 23 and a half hours exactly where the behavioral period is as well. So the, this is just very lovely correlations. And to just kind of take you through it, if we take out timeless, which is one of the critical genes for circadian uh, oscillations, we actually get arrhythmic behavior and arrhythmic 
oscillations, that is to say, no oscillations. And now if we do a, if we use a mutant that takes out the PDF uh, peptide, remember that PDF peptide I told, I told you about that is supposed to allow the master neurons to communicate with everyone else. Indeed, we start losing a lot of locomotion integrity and we lose oscillations over time. And interestingly, it falls into a 60 hour behavioral period. I have no idea why. Um, we can speculate on that in the question period if you're interested. Okay, so I have 15 minutes. So what I'm gonna do is actually, I'm going to kind of skip over us validating that we actually see the signal from where we say we see the signal and just get to get, get to the good stuff. Okay, so if we now start testing these oscillations in the specific neurons with the drivers that are available to us. Now we had, I think about 10 or 12 drivers that the field uses regularly. Only three of them really focus on the neurons that they're supposed to. The rest of them have background um, activity. So we excluded all of that. And you will note already that there are slight differences between um, oscillations in the neurons. They're very subtle, but the blue neurons oscillate slightly longer than all neurons put together. The pink neurons oscillate a little longer than that too, slightly longer period than that. And the green neurons oscillate closer to all other um, circadian clocks. So there seems to be some sort of variation already. If we now, uh, oh, this is fun actually, just as, a, as an aside, if we compare young and old flies, we also see a loss of the integrity of these clocks um, in different, differently in different neurons. You'll notice that the blue neurons lose the oscillation within a couple of days when they don't get external cues. And the pink neurons lose them within six days, and the green neurons lose them in three days. So their, um, I guess their robustness is also influenced by the context that they're in. Now, if we take out that PDF signaling uh, system, the one that's supposed to be communicating to everybody else, these neurons just oscillate fine. So, they're not being necessarily responsive to PDF the way that we thought. You'll remember with the behavior, in within a couple of days, behavior was toast. But these neurons are oscillating the, the way they're supposed to. The master clock neurons hardly have changed, although maybe I'll just show you this data. Their behavioral period does get a little longer when you take out the PDF signal. The pink neurons, same. They get slightly longer. The green neurons, they don't change at all. But after six days, they stop oscillating altogether. Their period doesn't change. They just kind of give up. So with a single mutation, again, this is a bit of a proof of principle in a way. Some neurons become longer, uh, excuse me, clocks in some neurons uh, start oscillating with a longer period in some neurons, and they stop oscillating in other neurons, which suggests then that a single mutation can have variable effects in different parts of the brain. So that is now leading me to uh, wrap this up a little bit and also to uh, tell you about the latest information that's coming out of my lab. And that involves, well, how do these neurons communicate with each other then? More specifically, how do the different clocks communicate with each other? Is if there are specific pathways across different clocks, we should be able to manipulate some clocks, measure others, and show that there are different uh, pairings, if you will, under different circumstances. So what we've done is we've taken eye clocks, because there are clocks in the eye as well, and in a wild type fly, we assume that all clocks are synchronized with their environment, so it's the same, everything is happy. And we ask the question, if we change the eye clock now, what changes in the brain? First of all, when we took out the eye clock, we noticed a behavioral change shown here in red. 
Now, if you look carefully, you'll notice that oscillations have not gone away, but they've kind of changed in architecture a little bit. If you look very closely, you'll notice that morning anticipation is gone. Evening anticipation is not affected. Now, this already is a little weird because it's supposed to be these pink neurons that regulate morning anticipation, but eye clocks seem to be affecting that. Okay, well, let's just put that aside. It does kind of hint at if the eye is talking to the uh, pink neurons or not. But when we start to look to see what happens in the brain when we eliminate the clock in the eye, we find that these green neurons are hit really hard. They kind of hang in there for a couple of days, and then it, it just starts to oscillate wildly. This, the peak has shifted forward, the oscillations are not 24 hours anymore, and then it kind of snaps back together at day seven or eight. Now, why does this happen? I don't, uh, I, I'm not completely clear on. This data um, I got about a week ago. But what I suspect is happening is that the eye clock, we know that the eye clock stops oscillating in constant darkness, in constant conditions after about four days. So it could be that the input signals coming in from the eye are messing things up with the green neurons, but after, this, uh, after the influence of the eye diminishes, these green neurons start paying attention to lesser neurons and kind of snap back into it. The blue neurons, the ones that are supposed to be getting input from the eye, are affected in a very similar way, but arguably not in the same magnitude. The brown neurons are slightly influenced, but not really. And I would argue that the uh, pink neurons up here are not affected at all. So what we have here is the eyes that are influencing blue neurons and green neurons and not really much else. But what we don't know is if the green neurons are responding directly to the eye or if there's some sort of different pathway where the eye is influencing the blue, which is influencing the green. So the next set of experiments after we verify all of this preliminary data, of course, is going to be to eliminate either the clock or the uh, firing of the blue neurons and measure the green while eliminating the eye. So in this way, what we're trying to do is not only um, is not limit ourselves to the physical map of the neuronal connections across the brain, but to see what the communication pathways are. The analogy of that would be uh, inferring where the roads are by looking at the traffic without actually having a physical map. So ultimately, I am hoping in the next 10 to 15 years or so, we'll start to be able to answer the question of how information across neurons are integrated. Is a neuron, in other words, some sort of CPU, or is it simply a cable to transmit information? And I want to leave you with this uh, again. This is just a little uh, pet hypothesis of mine, and um, this will be the last slide. If we say something like a phosphorylation event regulates a simple event like nuclear entry, if we can oversimplify it that way, we can perhaps call this the minimal biochemical unit. So if you, have an, uh, if you have a biochemical event where a protein does something or does not do something, and you have a bunch of events like that in a row, what you have is a bunch of ones and zeros that are put in a row. And a bunch of ones and zeros in a row is binary code. So what I'm thinking might be happening, what I think we need to uh, consider when trying to understand behavior is that perhaps the biochemistry can be seen as the operating system and the neurons, the synaptic connections, the neuropeptide releases are the hardware. And to be able to understand how the computer works, we have to consider both. And with that, just want to thank the funding agencies and the uh, crack team of young scientists that I have. Um, a lot of this uh, information that I shared with you is based on Peter's work and Mia's work. And the rest of the team is working on a whole bunch of really, really cool projects that hopefully I'll be able to tell you about when they're closer to fruition. Thank you very much for your time.